Good Chavez. Whether you're here in the Bark Sanctuary from your homes this evening, it's great to have you with us. Now, I thought all bad events were supposed to end in 2020. And I also thought after living in Houston for nearly 20 years, I had seen it all. I was wrong. First, and most importantly, I hope everyone is okay. I know we Houstonians have become very hardened individuals over the last several years, but this was a new one. And I think we all know more now about ERCOT and frozen pipes than we ever wanted to know. And as we slowly but surely move out of this, if you need anything, please contact me. Well, I think most of you now have your power and water back, but if you still need help for anything, dealing with this storm, and of course, really anything, you can always contact your clergy or call me. My cell is 713-449-9921. We're all here for you, to help you during this challenging time. In my 20 years as a rabbi, I've often been reminded that the weekly Torah portion has the lessons we need just at the perfect time. And this week was no different. Tonight I want to share with you three ideas from our Torah portion of this week, Parsha Truma. Number one, this is our first Torah portion to deal with the details of the Mishkan's construction. As our people journeyed from slavery to freedom, the Mishkan was their first place, their first gathering place to worship God. The rabbis note that three of the Mishkan's vessels, the altar, the table, and the ark, all contained a zer, a decorative golden rim that resembled a crown. And the rabbis associate each of these crowns with a different religious value. The crown of the altar, where the sacrifices were offered by the priest, symbolized the priesthood, which Aaron took for himself and his descendants. The crown of the table, which connotes abundance and wealth, that symbolized the kingship, which King David took for himself and his descendants. But the crown of the ark, where the tablets given on Sinai were housed, symbolized Torah, which a rabbi say is still sitting and waiting to be acquired and anyone, anyone who wishes may come and take Torah. Torah study for thousands of years became the great equalizer accessible to anyone who wished to pursue it, regardless of their wealth, regardless of their lineage, any Jew going through school was taught to read so they could study Torah. The Talmudic rabbis, the champions of Torah study found that this was a way to ensure that all Jews had a place, that all Jews should be given equal opportunity, that everyone should be treated the same. This week, here in Houston, and throughout the great state of Texas, was another reminder we are all really the same. All of us. No matter where we live in this great city, no matter how large our home is, we were all in this together. I'll never forget this past Monday night as I tried to sleep shivering in the bitter cold with floor blankets on top of me. And I was extremely jealous of half my neighborhood. Earlier in the night, just two streets away, right on the street named Verone, on one side of the street, on my side of the street, on the north side, for several blocks to the north, all the homes were pitch black. But just on the other side of that street, south of Verone, for several blocks all the way to Beechnut, they all had power. At that point, we had gone almost 15 hours with no power. Were there nicer homes on the other side of Verone? Was there someone rich and powerful there? Did someone work for Centerpoint in that neighborhood? What was going on? Why did they have power and we didn't? But then I woke up at one in the morning with a pleasant surprise. We had our power back. 
and a friend of mine who lived south of Verone, they were out of luck. And they were out of power now for the next 15 hours. It was a reminder this week that it really didn't matter where you lived. It didn't matter what you did for a living, what area of town you lived in, how large that home was, or how small your apartment is. When you lose power or water, any place is a very tough one to live in. Cold air, a loss of electricity, frozen or broken pipes, these challenges know no boundaries. Because in the end, we are all the same. And it's not the size of our homes that define us. It's being thankful that we have our basic needs taken care of. When it comes to that, no matter who we are, we are all equal. That brings me to the second lesson that we were reminded of this week from our Torah portion. The ark in that Mishkan had to be overlaid with a cover of pure gold on both the inside and on the outside. As we read this week, from within and without, you shall cover it with gold. The great Talmudic sage Rava interprets this architectural requirement as a description of the proper character of a Torah scholar. He states that any Torah scholar whose inside is not like his outside, it's not a true Torah scholar, but rather a scholar of Torah must uphold the same values in his private life as in his public life. And just as the ark must have the same pure gold on the inside as it does on the outside. Yes, this week, many of us went days without water or power. I was finally able to take my first shower of the week yesterday. And I think like many of you, that first shower was the best shower of my entire life. On the outside this week, we were all struggling. But how'd you hold up on the inside? Did you take care of your loved ones? Did you look out for neighbors? Did you contact older friends and family who may have been alone? Did you offer help? to strangers in need? If not, how can you grow from this experience so next time you do? It's been said many times that our true character comes out in times of trouble. If we have a beautiful life on the outside, just how beautiful is your life on the inside? And number three, the third lesson I believe we can learn from this week's Torah portion. The Talmud teaches that according to the tradition in the Mishkan, there were 12 loaves of bread made of fine flour and arranged in two piles on the table in that sanctuary. The Torah states that they had to be there always before God, always. They had to be on the table at all times. And the rabbis described the elaborate routine whereby one set of priests would remove the previous week's loaves of bread. At the very same instant, another set of priests set down the new bread. The two Munich rabbis struck by this obsessive concern with ensuring that the table was not left bare for even an instant. Yes, we are normally blessed to have safe food, safe water, warm shelter every night of our lives. Most of the time, we don't ever, ever have to worry, where will I sleep tonight? Will it be warm? Or in the summer, will it be cool? Will I have dinner tonight? Will I have enough food tomorrow to feed myself and my family? It's not a worry that I think any of us ever think about. Our tables are rarely left bare. Now that we know what it's like not knowing if we will have a warm bed to sleep, not knowing if we'll be able to get safe water to drink, not knowing if we'll be able to find food at the grocery store, now that we know these things and we've lived it for days and some are still living that way, can we do more to help those who deal with these same challenges every single day? 
I'm reminded of the words, the great words of Isaiah that we read on Yom Kippur in the Haftarah. Isaiah reminds us that morning on the most important day of the year, yes, fasting on Yom Kippur is important. But if going without food and water for just one day on Yom Kippur does not make us in the year ahead more generous, more giving, more helpful to those who often go without food and water for days at a time, then fasting on Yom Kippur is actually a complete waste of time. Think about that. The rabbis of old, who were so concerned about rituals, still allow a Haftarah reading on the holiest day of the year that teaches that our fast is worthless, worthless, if it doesn't change us for the better, if it doesn't make us more compassionate, if it doesn't fill us with care and concern for others in need. Did this week change you? Did this week make you more attuned to the needs of too many Houstonians who go every day of the year, not sure how they will feed their children that night? and unsure they'll have a safe place to sleep. My friends, it's been a difficult week. and We as Houstonians know difficult times. We will overcome this challenge. We'll be stronger for it. Will we be better for it? Will we be better human beings? Will we be better Jews? Yes, we as Houstonians will deal with these same natural disasters again. And I imagine that they will happen more in August and September than in February. But when they happen again, how will we respond? Shabbat Shalom.